to suss out any differences in terminology, to suss out any differences in terminology. Mo? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, also, to put step one into practice, USAID encourages the practice of co-creation and co collaborative approaches, uh, which we define as a design approach that brings people together to collectively produce a mutually valued outcome using a participatory process that assumes some degree of shared power and decision making. Um, this is really a, a very useful tool that's been coming to light and is being used across many, many missions now, and especially as Washington. It's been highlighted as best practice and really the time early in the planning cycle for all stakeholders to come together and start to put their concerns on the table before we reach the solicitation or even possibly the award phase. Things like co-creation can be used at various points throughout the USA program cycle. For purposes of this webinar, we want to highlight it at least three ways for potential implementing partners to engage in the co-creation with USAID at the activity level for the purposes of aligning on shared goals without running afoul of procurement challenges that we've seen in the past. The first would be in response to annual program statements. The second is in response to broad agency announcements. And the third is industry days. These are really three critical areas where industry can engage or keep a lookout on um, portals such as FedBizOps or Grants.gov because they're always announced through the government point of entry. And it's very encouraging that we've seen such collaboration early and often. And for those of you who are on the webinar who've been, who have participated in such days, we wanted to say thank you in advance and please continue to do so. Um, and I'd like to also stress the importance of the funder, donor, considering the viewpoint of the implementing partner. If we don't know what the challenges you may be facing, we can't make or create designs or adjust solicitations for future that would incorporate those challenges or that. Hi, is it back on? I... Yeah, you're back. Okay, I was just talking. Okay, thanks. Um, so just to, I'm sorry if it repeats, but the last point I was, I was just stressing the importance of the funders and the donors considering the implementing partner's perspective because early and often in the design phase, the absence of that perspective can leave a very big gap or possibly set up or establish a solicitation which is negatively facing or has negative consequences and early engagement could have resolved that. So I, I encourage us all to continue in that collaborative approach and process as we go through and mobilize uh, pay for results uh, as it will continue to gain speed through the agency. Great. Thank you, Mo. Um, <clears throat> so uh, once we have determined uh, what success is, uh, how do we get there? In addition to gaining consensus on outcomes and program end goals, stakeholders should also align upon a theory of change uh, that describes the interventions that needed uh, to uh, achieve completion of the objective. Again, what do we need to do to accomplish success? There are different ways to build theory of change, but it should be some sort of backwards mapping or problem tree exercise working backwards from the desired goal to look at the constraints, how to overcome those constraints, uh, and uh, uh, identify the steps needed to achieve the goal. This will result in the interventions that your initiative will undertake to uh, create the desired change. And within that, uh, you will determine the inputs uh, and the activities, which will result in the outputs which will result in the outcomes in the medium term, within the life of the award, and ultimately in the long term, which may exceed the life of the award. So let's turn to a concrete example here. 
So your mission director or your boss has called you into her office and has asked you to develop an initiative to address a health challenge, waterborne disease. And by the way, since Washington has always gone on about innovation, and she's also heard some promising things about using paper results, can you please incorporate that into the project design? <clears throat> you agree? Leave her office and immediately go to your colleague's desk, throw up your hands and say, I'm in big trouble. I've been tasked with developing a paper results water project, but I have no idea how to go about a paper results project. Your colleague kindly says, don't worry, I've just read this very handy guide on setting and pricing metrics, and I can walk you through the six steps that you need to take. So at your friend's suggestion, <coughs> You pull together a co-creation event, providing a whole range of implementing partners, government counterparts, representatives from targeted areas, uh, et cetera, to sort out what success will be and how to achieve that success. Some of the questions you will want to have answered in this process are what's the problem that communities are facing as it relates to access to clean water, and we know that's waterborne illness. What are the root causes of that problem? and where are the current gaps in addressing them? What are some of the best possible solutions for increasing access to clean water? What gaps could you directly affect within the next 12 to 36 months? And what would the cost be to close these gaps? And how does that cost compare to the expected benefit? So at the end of this process, <clears throat> the stakeholders have come up with conclusions. The challenge is waterborne disease, which is harming health and leading to lost school and work days. Uh, success is a significant reduction in waterborne disease in combination with increased availability to clean water. The best solution to the problem is establishing clean water provision sites where communities can go to access clean water. And the group actually, in this case, even went a bit further in suggesting uh, some success metric. So you report back to your mission director and she agrees that this makes sense and asks how you came up with the solution. You respond, it wasn't your solution, rather it was a solution that arose from a collaborative process with a full range of stakeholders. She is impressed. So, Having established what success is and how it will be accomplished, how are you going to know if you're getting there? Which performance metrics should you use? Uh, ADS is USAID's uh, automated directive system. ADS suggests seven criteria for selecting indicators or metrics. <clears throat> First of all, direct. Uh, directly tracks and clearly measures the intended result. Um, second, objective unambiguous about what is being measured. Useful for management may include agency level indicators which the agency needs to report to Congress or state. Um, fourth, practical, entailing data which can be obtained at a reasonable cost and effort. Attributable, uh, measuring results which are clearly uh, and reasonably attributable to USAID's efforts and not other, uh, and other forces at play. Timely uh, indicators for which data can be gathered in a timely manner so as to affect decision making. If things are not going right uh, in an activity, clearly you want to be able to know that early on to change uh, what you're doing. And adequate, enough indicators to effectively measure performance. There are other criteria which also may be useful in qualifying the metrics or in sharpening the, uh, the targets uh, and the performance indicators. For example, as we look at results, how do we assure that the results are additive? The results would not have otherwise happened without our intervention. How should we value and measure the time to impact, how rapidly the results occur? the sustainability of this result, so we're not having to repeat the effort again and again, uh, that we are not creating negative market distortions. For example, 
undercutting existing water services providers uh, in the region. And finally, grading, getting greater value for our development dollars. Crowding in, where possible, the private sector and private sector funds to complement our funds, limiting the dollars we need uh, to get the results. So when you start looking, you discover that there are a huge number of possible metrics for determining success and progress towards that success. So you need to find a way to whittle that number down to the very best metrics. Using the ADS criteria as a starting point, you can create a prioritization framework, such as we have um, suggested, to help identify those best metrics. Trade-offs will have to be made because it will either be impractical or impossible to track metrics to touch upon all the criteria. In this example, we've used uh, three uh, of the uh, ADS criteria, direct, attributable, and practical. When brainstorming um, the initial list of metrics, uh, that can provide a first screen with other metrics used um, subsequently to whittle down to a reasonable number of metrics. Again, this is a qualitative exercise uh, or an art rather than science um, in this illustrative example, metrics one, three, and six are promising uh, based upon uh, their meeting the requirements of uh, all uh, three, direct, attributable, and practical. So turning back to our water example, we have now defined excess, success, and the initiatives we're going to undertake to achieve that success. And now we have some pretty good metrics uh, to measure how we're doing. First, we're going to look at the percentage of households with access to clean water sites. Again, this is easy and practical to measure, and it's clearly attributable to the initiative. We're going to look at the percentage of waterborne illness. A little more challenging, but we can do surveys, uh, which is practical, and it's clearly direct. It clearly uh, tracks our intended results, and it's objective. It, uh, either in, is accomplished or not. A cost per household, useful for management, uh, as we need to consider the cost benefit of the intervention, of all our interventions, uh, and should be concerned about value for money. Uh, how do we drive the cost down? Period of time, deliver access, direct and practical, the implementer can measure easily. Um, and it's important, uh, the period of time to deliver access if the challenge is an urgent one, such as, uh, for example, a bowl of response. And sustainability, the percentage of the uh, clean water provision sites in which fees cover the operating and uh, maintenance costs. Other possible impact metrics would include potentially the percent of clean water sites uh, in which water quality is rated good or higher, and uh, the number of reduced uh, work or school days lost from waterborne illness uh, in the region. So at this point, um, we have defined what success is, how to get there, and how are we going to measure success. We now need to take the third step to measure baseline to establish baselines on our targets. Reaching final agreement on targets and pricing for those tar targets will ultimately result from negotiation between the funder and the implementer. But as in all negotiations, it is better to come to the table of both parties with a sense of what a reasonable target should be. Targets need to be set against baselines, and they should ensure to the extent possible that accomplishment um, of the targets are as a result of the activity being undertaken. Setting targets is also more of an art uh, than a science because there are so many variables at play and the context is always dynamic rather than static. Where data is either unavailable or not easily accessible, targets may be established around international standards um, uh, such as the World Bank Data Bank, do it business indicators, uh, et cetera. So for uh, quickly for serious M&E uh, evaluation, modern evaluation people, they uh, like to think about impacts in terms of uh, the counterfactual. Counterfactual asks the question, what would happen if my program did not exist? Um, some types of counterfactuals include baselines, which is really our focus, uh, data gathered at the beginning of the project, understand the current state, and this is USAID's uh, usual approach. 
and controls, which is a more sophisticated approach, uses a comparison group that is not receiving the intervention, using an experimental or quasi-experimental evaluation approaches. This is a gold standard, but it's costly and rare for USAID. Again, at USAID, we almost always use baseline. So once you have established your baseline, you're then in a position to think about reasonable targets. Again, target setting is ultimately a negotiation between the funder and the implementer. And of course, if your target's too high, no implementer is going to uh, want to undertake the initiative. But you need to come to the table with your own um, uh, targets in mind. For one thing, it allows you to do an initial cost benefit. If you know what your target is, for example, an additional 10,000 households with access to clean water stations, you're in a better position to determine whether the cost of achieving that result is worth it. Perhaps there are other better uses for those development funds. Lastly, types of targets include internal targets, which focus upon the implementer's uh, performance and performance improvements over time, and external targets in which uh, performance benchmarks is benchmarked against external indices. And uh, we also see uh, uh, metrics that would be, uh, or targets would be process targets. Um, if we see how we're getting there as well as final end result uh, targets. And of course, targets should be sufficiently ambitious to incentivize improved performance. <clears throat> so moving right ahead, um, with our message established, just quickly, uh, we have established a baseline here. Um, from there, a target is set, and there's agreement uh, is reached on an acceptable data source. So let's turn it over again. Uh, Mo, do you have a PEPFAR example for us? Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. So um, just to set the stage and, and to help everyone understand what was going on, we had um, we had one contractor who, or one implementing partner, I should say, who is phasing out. So we were seeing a large demobilization stage, and we had a new implementing contractor coming in, and they had about a two to three month layover um, where both were one was moving down and one was coming up, and. For the one that was exiting a year prior, what we had did, what we did was, we established a pay for results, a pay for performance um, methodology, and we had converted their mechanism into a performance-based mechanism, specifically tying payments to the achievement of specific outcomes that were important in the realm of PEPFAR. Um, for those of us who who know what PEPFAR is. Uh, their targets are delineated on an annual basis and, and given by OGAC, which is the office that, that oversees the program across all countries. So we had, a, we had a very clean opportunity where the targets were well defined, we had a means to measure those targets, and we had a way to consistently apply the same approach year after year. So that being said, typically in any project when we're seeing a closeout type phase, we see a decline in performance because implementing partners are removing personnel, they're removing equipment and trying to get them uh, to get either out of the country or finish the project or continue doing their normal work in the absence of the U USA funding. Um, in the fiscal year prior to changing the performance over into a performance-based methodology, we saw only 56% of the targets being achieved. Then we introduced the performance-based contracting methodology, and the following year, the, the implementing partner that was leaving achieved 101%, and the new implementing partner that was coming in achieved 86%. Now, these were unprecedented numbers in the realm of PEPFAR, and it's become a best practice, and it's moving throughout, these lessons learned are moving throughout the agency. But this was very one very clear way where everybody was able to understand what were the targets, what is the baseline, how am I being measured, and how will my performance catalyze into a financial gain or loss. And with those combinations and a mutual understanding between USAID and the implementing partners, we were able to achieve massive amounts of success. 
which is actually putting Zambia as one of the first countries to reach epidemic control, possibly within the next year or two years. So that's in the PEPFAR realm. I also have a different example in education where we have uh, the problem statement was children were not reading at grade level, as specifically children from the years of kindergarten through three years old. Every two years, the government has an established means of measuring, and it's called an EGRA, which is an early grade reading assessment. And what we found was that only 20% were reading at grade level. So we were able to establish a baseline. We worked with the government, we worked with our implementing partner, and we put it through the solicitation of what we, what we would hope that after the five years and the amount of funding that USAID put in, the end uh, target would be. We had a collaborative approach and we used things like oral presentations, co-creation through the solicitation process, and we're starting to see the yields of that result. But this example is really some, a, a way that we we're able to put it into the solicitation early, get engagement not only with implementing partner community, but also with the government, and design a project that reflects the needs of what's currently happening. But again, we were only able to do that because we had a baseline, we had an established target which was realistic and reasonable to achieve, we had implementing partner and stakeholder input, and we had consistent communication through the process. So, Lawrence, I hope these two examples were helpful, and I want to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mo. Very, very helpful. Uh, really remarkable uh, results on that. Thank you. So I'm going to push through uh, quickly. So we're at step three now. Um, we have defined the problem and have established success uh, in the intervention we need to take. Uh, we've determined the metrics that we will use to measure progress and the data sources for those metrics, and we have completed our third step of setting our baseline. Uh, what is the as-is situation and our targets? What is the to-be situation, assuming that our intervention uh, is successful? So I won't go through all these examples, but as you can see, um, a number of sort of diverse indicators, uh, each with a baseline and target. Um, and uh, uh, we're looking at uh, basically uh, clean water access, waterborne illness, the end result, uh, the cost, uh, sustainability. And the point um, I want to make here is that rather than looking at one indicator, uh, this really provides us with uh, a kind of a broad spectrum of metrics so we can really look at the broader issues of are we achieving sustainability and the multi, um, you know, development objectives that we have uh, in our projects. So one of the benefits here is that we can have multiple uh, elements on which we pay, uh, which is a benefit for the implementer as well. Few implementers are able to simply uh, afford to uh, undertake activities with the hope that at the very end of the activity in three years uh, they will pay it out. This provides indicators uh, that can be done, uh, process indicators, and milestones as they move ahead. So with that, I want to turn it over to Christine to uh, follow up on the next three steps. Thank you, Lawrence. So Lawrence graciously went over the uh, how to align on shared goals, how we translate those goals into measurable metrics, and then establishing an understanding of what the current state is. Next. One of the areas where we get a lot of questions is how to determine which evaluation approach is the best. Oftentimes what we've found is that that approach is often based on the amount of rigor funders are comfortable with, since ultimately they're the ones who are deciding whether or not to pay for a program or an intervention. So as you see on this slide from left to right, shows showcases the different designs based on level of rigor. For non-experimental designs where we don't have a unique comparison group, we really measure the outcomes of the program participants before and after the program. The quasi-experimental designs measures outcomes for program participants and similar non-participants, so utilizing that comparison group. And finally, experimental designs randomize participants into a treatment or control group and measures the outcomes for both over the period of time. 
So before we jump into the advantages and disadvantages, I did want to note that we see tremendous value, if not sometimes more value, in separately conducting ongoing evaluation throughout the contract period rather than just evaluating at the very end to determine success. It allows for program adaptation using real-time feedback. So in addition to financial incentives, stakeholders frequently mention how valuable it is just to have access to some of the data that usually funders or government funders have at their disposal. And so most times these insights are not shared back with the implementers, and so they see this as a huge non-financial incentive. This is a part that often gets missed. So I just wanted to make sure that I reinforce it here. So going into the advantages and disadvantages, um, as Lawrence mentioned, RCTs are often touted as the gold standard of evidence, but very costly and something that USAID tends to steer away from. Um, RCTs or experimental designs can isolate the impact of a program with a high degree of confidence by minimizing potential bias but it requires significant resources to both ensure that the program design can accommodate randomization, so the sample size has to be large enough, but also how you implement that accordingly. Most cases we see either a quasi-experimental design or a non-experimental design. Quasi-experimental designs can isolate the impact of a program as long as other variables can be controlled for or sufficient data is available to the evaluators. Some necessary data would be prior known propensity for negative outcomes. For non-experimental design, um, usually requires less resources and population sizes can vary. However, it's quite susceptible to bias since performance is not compared to a counterfactual. This one negotiation process between the funders and implementers may be longer to ensure all of the terms and conditions are agreed upon. I'm going to turn it over briefly to Jonathan to provide some comments. Thank you, Christine. One lesson learned from a USAID program team involving the Development Impact Bond for Poverty Alleviation in Sub-Saharan Africa was that when they actually used the, a randomized control trial as their evaluation approach, they determined in hindsight it might have been better to take either a non-experimental or a quasi-experimental approach instead. This had to do with the fact that the graduation approach had already been proven to work in other areas of the world and had been supported by a global randomized control trial already. So in this case, when an RCT was involved in the activity design, they mentioned as a lesson learned in hindsight that the evaluation costs associated with this development impact bond were high enough as is, and several stakeholders questioned whether the use of such a rigorous evaluation design would be sustainable in the future. To reduce the relative cost of the evaluation of future instruments, stakeholders should consider carefully whether a leaner RCT methodology or non-RCT methodology is possible and sufficient, and whether future paper results instruments really require an RCT evaluation. Of course, the issue of high verification costs in relation to outcome payments will be diminished as the volume of outcome payments increases. One recommendation to reduce costs is for stakeholders to leverage local evaluation experts, which tend to be significantly less expensive than large international evaluation firms. Christine? Thank you, Jonathan. So going back to the water example that we've been starting with, uh, we want to think about a few different questions as we decide on which evaluation model would be best. So some of the questions that we ponder are, are we working with a small population? If so, it would be more suitable for a non-experimental or quasi-experimental model. Is it unethical to design? to deny service to a comparison population. Since we're talking about water, we probably would say yes. And so we probably lean toward the non-experimental or quasi-experimental. And finally, do we have other operational considerations that may complicate randomization? Since we're talking about a clean water provision site, it's pretty difficult to limit access to who in the community may or may not. 
Although it would be feasible to go with a quasi-experimental control group, given that there are similar sites that are funded by other development organizations, we know that it's unnecessarily complex to try to control for all the confounding factors. So instead, we decide to use a non-experimental design that uses pre-project metrics as a baseline. And so for that, we plan on using three different metrics. The first one is households within the clean water provision site that can walk within 15 minutes. The second would be the number of households in the area suffering from waterborne illnesses annually. And the third is the average time to establish uh, a clean water provision site. So once we've selected them, we'll move on to figuring out how do we really price these metrics. So in terms of figuring out what the right pricing is, there are many different ways in which you can approach it. Some common ways that we've seen both at Third Sector and at USAID is conducting a cost-benefit analysis, deriving costs from other comparable projects, or establishing a competitive procurement process. The cost-benefit analysis usually is used to quantify the economic benefits to be realized based on the accomplishment of metrics. So for instance, if we were to have a program that is hoping to reduce recidivism, we would look at all of the remedial costs associated with someone who actually does um, get convicted and enter the judicial system. And so we would then measure that against the cost of actually providing the intervention. So if we are preventing um, in-person counseling or wraparound services, we would cost that out and then measure what is the difference. The other way that we can do it is comparing across projects that are similar in issue area or in country. So the cost associated with those projects would serve as a proxy, and based on comfort level around those proxy measures, you could then create a benchmark, fully understanding that this would have to align with the funder's willingness to pay. And then the third way is really having a formal process of creating a solicitation which basically seeks the foster competition among implementers wanting to engage in C for R and provide services and goods under that contracting model. I'm going to briefly turn over to Mo to provide a little bit of context based on his experience. Thanks so much. Um, as Christine mentioned, you know, competitive solicitations is the time where we look at fostering organizations to bring in innovative ideas and technical approaches to so solve some of our development challenges. Uh, contrary to popular belief, while cost or price is a, a factor, it's not most of the time the defining factor. Now, we could get into a contracting course about lowest price technically acceptable versus trade-off, but USA generally looks at technical first before it looks at pricing. So with that in mind, uh, look, uh, when an implementing partner is able to provide us an innovative solution, pricing is a part of that innovative solution. What are the cost drivers that, that an implementing partner or an organization is looking at? How is it looking to get the biggest cost benefit analysis? One of the best proposals that I've seen actually had that dialogue within it and was able to quantify how it was reaching a, a bigger value for dollar compared to possibly other solutions that may be out there. I thought that that really provided a holistic approach or holistic perspective of how the implementing partner not only said, this is how we're going to spend the dollar, but this is how far that dollar is going to go, and this is the development impact that that dollar is going to come back. I think that it's a very good opportunity, especially in the co-creation and collaboration process as well, to start having these conversations about, well, what kind of project are we trying to put together, and does the funding associate with that project? Are the results, are the baselines and the, the deviation thereof in between the two, and the funding source that's allocated, is it enough? Is it too much? Um, 
luckily enough, we had actually an experience where someone said, that's way too much money. I thought I'd never hear that before. But they said there was another solution that would get us there without having to spend that, the, the type of funds we thought were needed for that solution. So in that competitive solicitation process, whether it's via the request for information, the co-creation, um, the response to a solicitation, it really, please bring those ideas forward because that's when we can start looking at, well, if we have an idea or model of how we think things are supposed to be costed or priced out, is that correct? Or should we adjust it? Because adjusting the solicitation in the preliminary phase is easy. Once we get into the part where uh, an implementing partner or groups have submitted their offers or their proposals, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to pivot at that point without breaking competition regulations, procurement regulations. So it, that is the point of no return. Um, for lack of better word. I mean, we can always come back, but just for the purposes of the webinar. So, Christine, back over to you. Thanks for that. Thank you, Mo. So, in terms of next steps, once you set the pricing level, you want to think about how do you actually structure the performance payments. Oftentimes, pay for results tries to shift some of the risk from the funder to the implementer. However, few implementers are really willing or able to accept all of that risk. And so the performance payments itself should provide enough protection for the implementer so that they can still cover some of their costs, if not all of the costs, of actually providing the services while simultaneously providing sufficient financial benefit um, to the implementer to keep them motivated. Um, if it's not large enough, then the cost of actually implementing a P4R may outweigh the benefit. Some of the ways in structuring this um, really fall along a spectrum. And so the, on one end, you could go completely just paying purely for results. So the implementer would bear the cost of any upfront costs related to actually providing the services and we get paid on the achievement of those outcomes or agreed upon metrics. Another way of doing it would be a mixed system. So you could have partial cost coverage, so some cost reimbursement built in and would be paid out either at the beginning of the contract or at different intervals and then also have some of the reimbursement happen once outcomes are achieved. Another way to do it would be to have bonus payments. So in addition to cost reimbursement for the full cost of the intervention, you could also pay on the achievement of any additional outcomes if those brought value both to the funder and to the implementer. And then the final way that you can think about it is having a mix of different short-term and long-term metrics that are used in the contract for pay for results. So some of the short-term milestones may be more within the implementer's control and more focused on inputs or activities related to getting to the longer-term outcome. So well, I'm not sure if you had anything you wanted to add before we moved on to the water example. Yeah, sure. Just, um, just to help also reiterate, I know we mentioned contracts quite a few times, but this is also applicable to assistance as well. So please don't walk away from this thinking, oh, it's only a, an acquisition that could lend itself for pay for results, because that's not true. We, we were able to utilize pay for results in both acquisition and assistance. It, it's more about what is the result and the outcome and the principal purpose. So with that being said, um, I think it's also important for us to talk through realistic pricing and adjusting or pivoting when challenges do arise. Uh, you know, from the time a solicitation or a concept is in an inception phase to the award could be a significant amount of time where the conditions have changed. And from that award to anywhere from six months, a year, a year and a half, it could also be a constantly changing environment. So having those considerations, not only up front, but the dialogue 
with the implementing partner, the funders, the government, and the end beneficiary to ensure that however we've done our pricing or agreed to in the beginning, as we begin to implement and as implementation continues, are we still on the right path to achieve what it is that we needed to do? And in the times we are, that's great. And where we're not, equally we need to be able to say, hold on, we need to go back to the drawing board, we need to look at what, we're, what, what our end goal is and are we still able to achieve that. I think creating flexible mechanisms and also helping to understand what those conditions could be up front is a key strategy in designing and then implementing or awarding um, flexible mechanisms, whether they be contracts or uh, assistance mechanisms. So thanks, Christine, uh, for that opportunity as well. Thank you, Ma. So moving on to the water example. <clears throat> For this particular example, we found that there was a lot of robust data on similar projects. So we decided to build an economic model really to be predictive around what could the actual cost savings or benefits be to the funder. And so we based this model around key assumptions and inputs from past programming and comparable countries. The economic model assesses both the projected impact levels of the program or intervention on the metric, as well as the cost. And some of them, Lawrence had mentioned, hospitalizations or lost productivity due to waterborne illnesses. Given the strong interplay between the impact levels and the performance payments, for simplicity, we divide the total projected cost savings across the three metrics that we had decided upon, and then set the price based on the rate of success we expect. A lot of times, we'll weight the different metrics differently based on a number of factors. Uh, one of which in terms of contribution of the, the program on the actual outcome, but also the funder's interest and desire to pay for a certain outcome. So it is a fine balance, more of an art and science. Um, but an economic model can really help at least get you all on the same page by looking at the same predictions and using that to start the conversation. So the final step, and for in time, in interest of time, I won't belabor the point, but we all know that once you have a contract in place, it's extremely important to have the right mechanisms to both monitor performance to trigger success, but also to learn from the process. So the illustrative example at the bottom really showcases over the course of a contract, there needs to be consistent milestones and progress reports where the stakeholders who are initially brought together to define the shared goals look at what's actually happening on the ground and have opportunities to course correct and really be responsive to the needs in the community. In terms of the actual monitoring process, we really want to ensure integrity. In order to do so, we've seen two things be a critical component. The first is employing a third-party evaluator who is unbiased and hasn't been part of the program design or negotiation. That person or that entity really comes in to ensure that the outcomes that were agreed upon are being tracked and measured. We also help support the stringent data quality practices. In terms of data, we really want to think about three things, and this is usually a quick read upon in the negotiation process. The first is, what is the frequency of data collection? What is the quality of the data source or sources? And what is the reliability or validity of the data metric? In certain cases, these things have to be aligned across the different metrics to ensure that you're able to see true progress over the course of the contract. So as you can see on this slide, this is really more of a decision tree to determine when and if an implementer actually receives success. Um, I don't think we need to spend too much time going over this, but another thing that I wanted to really emphasize was that a lot of times we're focused on the triggering of payments. However, in addition to processes that help support the monitoring of those, it's important to have structures to also bring together those stakeholders. 
So in many of our projects, we've seen having an established governance structure is very important. So whether that be an advisory committee of key stakeholders who have decision-making power, who can look at the data on a frequent basis and make decisions about how they want to change either policy or programs, or even in some cases think about amendments to contracts if they are or not on target. And so I just wanted to bring that to light. So going back to the water example, the implementers we were working with were initially concerned about their ability to cover costs, which is often a concern, due to the payment term. So you decide to mitigate some of their risk by instituting partial performance payments tied to process measures. In the example on the slide, you'll see that an implementer would receive payments for hitting two of the three metrics. The two metrics we focus on um, number uh, or quantity. So number of households with access, um, the type of site that has good water quality, um, and then in terms of the number of households who are suffering from waterborne illness, that may be difficult to quantify just by counting the total number of households, but really having to do additional assessments like qualitative analyses in the form of surveys or other um, participatory models. And so for our water example, we see that implementers would get paid on the first two, um, but would have to do additional um, either investigation or evaluation to hit the third. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Lauren. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christine and uh, uh, Jonathan and Mo. <coughs> um, so looking at our top takeaways, um, nothing very dramatic here, uh, but paper results is trending. It's trending and should be trending because it uh, has a great many benefits um, to uh, to the development uh, community. Um, uh, there are different ways in which paper results can be used in programming. Um, clearly, the simplest and most direct is through an award, a contract, or a, a uh, um, cooperative agreement. But these are not without uh, challenges, uh, and principle among them are uh, setting and pricing metrics. Luckily, Third Sector and USAID have written this uh, guide that can be used uh, on how uh, providing a process for setting and pricing metrics. Um, and finally, of the six steps, the first, uh, aligning on shared goals and defining success is arguably the, uh, the most important. Um, that's really the foundation upon which uh, everything is built. Um, so we want to turn to questions, but uh, do want to um, just say the other document I uh, referenced previously is called Pay for Results in Development, a practitioner, the, a uh, primer for practitioner uh, that we uh, developed in conjunction with um, um, uh, anyway, we look forward to uh, uh, hearing um, from you on that. So let's move um, to some of the questions that we have. Sorry, we developed that in conjunction with Palladium, um, uh, one of our implementing partners. Uh, so I think it's a very valuable um, uh, resource and suggest you, uh, you take a look at that as well. It's on the USAID website, or you can just find it uh, on Google, uh, Pay for Results in Development. So we do have some good questions here, and please keep them coming. Um, I will uh, just start out on uh, one and uh, 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 ask uh, my colleagues to weigh in as well. Uh, the first really resulted uh, question is about results uh, from Amy Oslander. What happens when there are external factors? That means that uh, basically the, the implementer doesn't get the results, but they're not uh, the implementer's fault. Uh, another one from Greg Jacobs, uh, that basically is an implementer. Um, uh, implementers feel compelled to kind of ramp up the results that they're going to achieve uh, because they're in a competitive process and if they don't uh, basically set some high targets, um, you know, others may, may, uh, may, may win the award. Um, and how do you, from Mark Weinman, uh, how do you deal with a scenario when uh, the results are measured uh, over some period of time after the conclusion of the project and there may be some exogenous shock? So let me just first uh, say um, our objective 
uh, in a paper results award is to pay the money um, because that means that uh, we have achieved uh, the results intended. Hopefully those are results that would not have been achieved otherwise. So uh, the idea is let's, uh, you know, let's set targets that are going to be aggressive but achievable. Um, I will say that part of the art of setting targets, and it's on um, the implementer as well as the funder, uh, USAID and others, is the art is really designing the set of metrics that really uh, work. So it has performance metrics or prof sorry, process metrics um, uh, as well as final um, end result metrics. One example is uh, when we uh, work with transaction advisors. Uh, in uh, some of our presence countries. Uh, many of them don't have the wherewithal to uh, take on um, transactions and work on those for, you know, six months or a year uh, with the, um, you know, without the possibility that they're going to get paid. So we do have in those uh, step metrics, uh, performance metrics, um, but with the balance really uh, upon the accomplishment of the end result. So I guess what I'd say in that is it's really the art is kind of coming up with, uh, you know, with metrics to make sense. But at the end of the day, this is about uh, shifting the risk uh, or portion of the risk uh, to the implementer, um, which also gives the implementer more flexibility. So if you're going to, you know, step up and uh, kind of take on the, the challenge, we need to be serious that uh, we're paying on results and not for best efforts. and um, even if things go awry, we obviously want our implementers to be uh, healthy and, and, and successful, but this is about paying for results. Any others? Hi, Lawrence. So from, uh, from a procurement perspective, I would, I would suggest that it's really continuing the conversation if we believe that we're going to set a target and not talk about that target through the life of the award, we're setting ourselves up for failure. So having clear, concise conversations, not only from the technical perspective, but also the contractual or, or agreement perspective on what are the impacts that are happening, what are the truths on the ground, and adjusting that pay for result as you move is very important. I would argue that it should be adjusted maybe every six months, maybe every year, but looking at nimble ways of ensuring that the on-the-ground truths as they come forward that may affect that result are known, planned for, incorporated within whichever mechanism you're working with so that it continues to incentivize realistic performance to realistic targets. Um, one of the challenges I've seen is that we are notified, or at least it comes to me, when it's too late. You know, uh, two and a half years into a project, oh, the government isn't responding. Well, have they just stopped responding, or have they not responded for two and a half years? So some of it is simple communication, ensuring everybody's in the loop, ensuring that when challenges are arising, um, they're clearly identified if they are linked to payment or metrics, that those metrics are clearly identified. And it's an iterative process throughout the life of the award, um, and that's incumbent on all sides. So I, I would say from the procurement perspective, that's one of the key takeaways. So just a quick question from uh, Lexine. You brought an example of specific conditional credit transfer programs. Um, there's some very successful ones in Latin America uh, that seem to have been successful, um, particularly in Brazil, uh, the Bolsa Familia. Um, those are fairly simple programs um, with uh, cash payments based upon uh, metrics such as ensuring your kids are staying in school, et cetera. Uh, but many believe that that has really been a, a remarkable force in, um, in basically the rise in uh, or the reduction in poverty uh, in uh, Brazil. A couple of other questions. These probably belong to uh, um, Mo. <clears throat> what are the key entry points for developing concepts uh, for and with USCD, pay for results concept? Um, and uh, what is the process uh, from USCD Mali? What's the process if there's a disagreement between the donor and the implementing partner 
over uh, whether the result has been achieved. And, and uh, third one, what if the implementer withdraws midway? Well, um, really good question. So I'm going to keep this very high level because uh, as I was taught early in my career, the devil is always in the details. But um, to, to go in order there, um, I would say that the entry points are typically when you're seeing the announcements. The business forecast is a wonderful opportunity to know exactly what's coming down the pike and it's broken out not only by mission but technical sector and Washington as well. So I would say keeping an eye on that business forecast is in a, a very good business practice. When RFIs or, or which is a request for information or an industry day or a broad agency announcement is released acting upon it and ensuring that uh, your thoughts are, are documented and submitted on time for consideration. So that's, the, in my opinion, one of the best ways to engage. Um, moving on to the next question, which was about what happens if we can't agree to the results. I, that's why I, I would say this is one of the reasons that Jonathan Lawrence and I all started with step one and everybody spoke on it because that mutual understanding is imperative and if there's ambiguity or vagueness within how am I being measured and what are the positive and negative consequences for achieving the result, if that's not known up front then you're not, you haven't established the um, spirit of what pay for results is. We should not be ending in a position where the implementing partner doesn't have enough money to make ends meet or that the government is, it's, it's supposed to be a win-win situation and pay for results is just a methodology and a technique to get to win-win. Um, I would say probably at that point, if, the, if a dispute continues, there are dispute resolution clauses, there's techniques, that, negotiating techniques we can implore, but I would be hopeful that before it reached that position, the communication was clear and there's a better understanding because if it gets there, I'm guessing it'll get very legal very quickly and it'll all be about the details. Now, as far as the final question, which was what if a partner uh, leaves halfway, uh, again, it would probably get very legal very quick. It, it would depend on what the circumstances were, why the partner's leaving, under what recourse is the partner leaving, was it government invoked, was it partner invoked, um, but I, we would hope that that wouldn't happen either. We, it would be out of the spirit of what pay for results is trying to achieve. So while not direct answers, um, I'm hopeful that that helps catalyze what we're trying to achieve, not only through this webinar, but as an agency initiative as well. Great. Let me turn it to uh, see Christine, if you uh, have any thoughts of that um, as uh, an implementer. Uh, in addition to that, there's a question about uh, that you sort of raised uh, earlier about the ethical uh, uh, implications of control groups uh, and those who don't get the benefits of controlled control groups or are not, uh, yeah, so, Thanks, those are inside and those are outside. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, I will take the conversation about the ethical nature of RCTs and so from third sector standpoint, a lot of our projects, our launch um, social impact bonds, um, do have RCTs um, attached to them for payment purposes. And the difficulty that we had there was a matter of can we withhold certain types of treatment for um, the population. And so when designing that social impact bond, really that conversation came about when we were selecting the right intervention. Um, and so that for us really happened at the very beginning of the, the project design, um, even before we get into what are the outcomes that we want to measure and how much are we willing to pay for those. And so I guess that's one thing that I would note, especially for those of you who are thinking about uh, pay for results concepts, it would be 
that that's a critical component of whether or not you decide to move forward in using P for R, um, is whether or not your intervention will allow for you, if the funders require an RCT, to actually apply that type of rigor without having those ethical concerns. Uh, so the Mercy Corps, um, question from Mercy Corps, will USAID consider hybrid uh, activities, uh, which uh, are sort of mixed, um, where some of the costs are covered and some of the, uh, um, uh, there's also a pay for results uh, element to it. I think I know the answer to that, but I'm going to turn to Mo on that. <laughs> Thanks, Lawrence. Definitely. And um, uh, I would say we're starting to see more and more of hybrid approaches. I would just suggest that it, during the question and answer, or engagement period, whatever that looks like um, under each solicitation, since they could be different. Um, I, I, if I was an implementing partner, those were the recommendations that I would be making because that adds value to the process and that helps identify how you're thinking about things differently. And we're not just doing business the same way as we did or as we have been doing. Um, many of us are looking to answer that question what does each country's journey to self-reliance look like? How are we working towards that goal? And I would argue pay for results and creating hybrid mechanisms that traditionally were only cost reimbursement um, is a, a, a great step to that, um, to that outcome or even our own objective that we're looking to achieve. So great question and the answer is yes, it can be done. And I would also uh, implore industry to continue to engage and identify areas or times where it could be hybridized um, in solicitations. Great. Um, <clears throat> so um, again, uh, I think we have uh, similar uh, questions about how these uh, awards can be structured. I think the answer is they can be um, structured in very flexible ways. I think we all agree that uh, uh, the idea that uh, um, it's all or nothing is not an optimal uh, approach. Um, so we have one from Glenn Kenna. Does the uh, um, donor pay once targeted uh, implemented partner covers the operational cost? Once the target to meet so the uh, implementing partner can cover the op for the operational cost. Uh, again, I think what we are proposing is a, a, a blend of uh, metrics. So uh, uh, both parties are not um, overly exposed uh, to risk, uh, but there certainly is a risk sharing attitude that uh, does encourage uh, the innovation that we want to get. Um, I don't know that we have uh, more in there. There's a question um, about uh, from uh, Yvonne about uh, uh, reporting. Um, and if you have, for example, government census reports coming only every 10 years, um, I would say that goes again uh, to, again, making sure that the metrics you have are timely, are uh, accessible. Um, and that you find metrics that will work for you. So uh, with that, I think we are uh, we're done. And I really appreciate everybody's interest. Um, we uh, certainly look forward to hearing from you with any questions. Uh, we hope you will uh, take a look at the guide and that will be useful for you. I want to thank everyone for participating. I do want to note that this month at Market Links is Pay for Results Month. So please come to your, uh, if you have blogs, if you have comments, if you have something you want to post, please uh, post that on Market Links and check Market Links frequently because uh, it's got a huge amount of, of resources. Just a reminder, the next Market Links webinar is September 5th, and it's going to be on the currency of connection. So thank you, Christine, Jonathan, Mo, and all of the um, 
uh, participants in the webinar, and Charlene and the team here at TRG.